Hello everyone, I am Angie, otherwise known as Turbo. I attended the afternoon session for day one of the trial for Alan. I have some notes here. Um, we've kind of had to split things up. Sarah attended the morning session. She was able to get in and I was able to get in for the afternoon session. Um, so we got uh, at 1.26 uh, the family of Alan came in. Uh, Alan had beige pants on with a brown belt and a pink and blue checked shirt. He had his glasses on his head. I did not see him put his glasses on once. So I don't know if he's trying to look smart <laughs> or, you know, what. But anyway, it kind of reminded me of the way people wear sunglasses on their heads. I actually had to look and see if they were sunglasses. At 1.35, Stacey Diener for the prosecution called Kelsey to the stand. Judge Gull swore her in. Uh, it, her name now is Kelsey Siebert. And in 2017, she was, of course, Kelsey German. She grew up in Delphi, just outside of Delphi. Um, since she was very young, uh, she'd lived with her grandparents, uh, Mike and Beck Patty. Um... Liberty uh, was her full sister. Uh, Stacy Diener confirmed that, of course, uh, that they were full sisters. Her dad is Derek, and Uncle Cody also lived in the house. Kelsey went to Delphi High School. She had additional education. Uh, she pursued a bachelor's in psych degree at Purdue University. Um, and she is currently employed. She works for her grandmother. Becky, and also at the Dairy Queen in Delphi. She's married with a daughter, and she has another on the way. In 2017, Kelsey was a junior in high school. She had the same types of activities as her sister, Libby. She was on the swim team. Diener asked her to describe her relationship more, and Kelsey said that she was very close to Libby, that she was her best friend. Uh, Libby's grade was similar in size, maybe a little bit bigger. She was familiar with uh, Abby, of course, uh, and uh, Abby had gone on vacation with Libby and her family. Um, she, she was over there often. She was a very good friend of Libby's and spent a lot of time there. Uh, Diener asked if Libby had her own phone. She said that she did not. Uh, Diener asked about Libby's personality and asked if she was someone that was brave and Kelsey said that she was very brave. Diener asked her if she could give an, an example of Libby being brave, maybe talk about the high bridge and Kelsey said that she personally was very scared of the Bonin High Bridge, but that Libby wasn't scared at all. When Kelsey went across on the bridge, uh, she'd been there uh, three times, actually, she testified. And when she had gone across, she was terrified. And she said that Libby wasn't scared at all. Um, she actually said she wouldn't let Libby go. <laughs> She was asked if she'd been to the trail with both Libby and Abby, and Kelsey testified that she had not been there with Abby. The morning of February 13, 2017, uh, she woke up late, Kelsey testified, and Diener asked her if Libby asked her to go earlier, and Kelsey said that she, Libby did ask and she wanted Kelsey to go with her and Abby. Um, and... Diener wanted to know if it was unusual for Kelsey to take her to the trails, and Kelsey said no. And Diener said, did you know anything about the plans? Was there, was there anything that related? Did she, she wanted to know if the girls took coats with them. Kelsey stated that she got the coats from, their, from her car. So Abby took a gray zip-up jacket and Libby had a swimming sweatshirt and Diener asked Kelsey to be more specific. Kelsey said that 
her and Libby were both on the swim teams and they both had swim sweatshirts. And then she discussed the white swim swim sweatshirt. And Diener wanted to know what were the girls doing on the way to the trail. Did you become aware that your sister had posted pictures taken in your car on social media? And Kelsey testified that she was not aware of that. Diener then went and handed the exhibit to a clerk beside Judge Gall. Uh, the, the clerk processed them and tagged them. And Diener entered exhibit number one. Now, they didn't show this exhibit on a screen or we, we had no visual on this exhibit in the gallery, but I could see that it was um, from, the, from the sheets that they had to hand out to the jury. I could see there was uh, these selfie pictures where uh, there was a significant chunk of white showing on, on, the, um, on the exhibit. And then she says, do you recognize Abby and Libby inside your car? Is the clothing similar to what they had on in the selfie? And she said, yes. So at this point, I observed um, the jurors. I looked up. <laughs> I, I mostly don't look up when I'm taking my notes. I, I kind of do a transcription style. I'm not the same as Sarah in that way. Uh, but I did look up to note the jury and I did see a lot of them taking notes. They were very um, engaged and actually the entire afternoon of day one, uh, I can really say that they, they were very um, engaged, uh, observing, listening, asking, you know, they ended up asking some questions. And I, I again, I'd probably say about, I saw about half of them taking notes at least. Um, at various points, like some of them took them all through and, and whatnot. So that was just a, an observation that I did make. Now, at this point in time, they brought in, uh, we had Holman and Mullins and a couple other people along the way. Uh, they were helping with these very large exhibits. So at this point, they brought in an eight foot wide by four foot high, approximately, uh, I gauged the size of this exhibit. It was exhibit number two for the state. And it was a large overview of uh, the Monon High Bridge. Uh, and they went on to cite various things. It was, this was the zoomed out exhibit. Um, we'll get into that a little later. So, Diener said, are you familiar with the Who's Your Harvest store? After you dropped the girls off, did you continue in the same direction? And now this is on 300 North. And Kelsey indicated yes. And then Diener discussed the mirror's entrance. And showed that there's a path that you can continue on there at the mirror's entrance to the bridge. And she, and she asked, is this helpful to depict if we have this on? The, Kelsey agreed, yes. So then Diener asked to admit and publish exhibit number two, which was this very large, very large uh, exhibit that was on an easel that the jury and the gallery could see, although I think it was more visible to the gallery on the right side of the courtroom. It was a little difficult if you were on the far left, but... Uh, this was made available and, and um, the jury was able to view this. So D Diener asked Kelsey to step down from the witness stand. She wanted to remind Kelsey to use her outside voice. Now, as we know, Kelsey's quite soft-spoken like Becky. Um, but on day one in the afternoon when I was there... It was very difficult to hear in the courtroom. Kelsey's was very challenging testimony to hear. Um, I was able to get a lot of notes on her testimony, but not, not, um, not quite everything, but most of it, I think. Um, so she brought Kelsey forward and brought her down in front of Judge Gall's bench, in front of the jury, in front of this large exhibit. 
And she asked her which direction she would have been coming from that day. And so they pointed on to the top right corner of this exhibit, showing them coming from um, their home. And Kelsey used her finger. She indicated that um, 300 North Highway runs horizontal. She asked her if she knew the name of that road. Uh, she said, I think she said no, although I don't have her response. Um, but I don't know that that really matters anyway. <laughs> um, so she pointed out the mirror's entrance and Kelsey agreed. That's where she dropped off the girl. She confirmed that. So Dina asked, where's the actual trail? And Kelsey indicated and showed the mirror's entrance in relation to the trail and she asked her, when you leave, where did you go? And she agreed that she continued on down 300 in the same direction she was traveling. She was traveling from east to the west. At this point, I looked up and I observed Alan analyzing the chart that was in front of him. He was quite engaged with that. Dina asked Kelsey, what is this highway? And it was the Who's Your Heartland Highway. Now that runs parallel to 300 North uh, above it, of course. So then Kelsey sat down. It was 1.58 p.m. in the day. Um, and Dina started questioning her again about the parking area where she dropped Libby and Abby. And agreed that it was a small entrance. And it, it only holds about maybe two cars where she dropped the girls off and on that particular day she pulled in she was asked where she went after she dropped them off and she said her boyfriend's house and they were uh, there for the remainder of the day they had gotten lunch in town now Kelsey was uh, sorry Diener said y you had to work is that why you couldn't go to the Monon High Bridge that day and she agreed that that was true Diener next asked about Libby's habits regarding her phone she wanted to know if Libby's phone was charged that day and Kelsey said that she didn't know she said do you remember what time you left your house around uh, Kelsey responded it was around 1:45, I believe she said so it was like less than 10 minutes to get there um, she said, when you learned that Abby and Libby were missing, did you try to return there to find her? And she wanted to know, tell me about when you went to go to the bridge. So Kelsey uh, was discussing about her uncle Cody and her, um, and they walked to the Monon High Bridge. Diener asked Kelsey to remind everyone who Cody was and the relationship. And Kelsey said, he's our uncle. He's my grandma's son. Diener says, it's only the second time that you've been on the Mountain High Bridge. And Kelsey said, uh, no, at least there was at least one other time. At this point in time, Lieutenant Jerry Holman uh, removed exhibit number two. And Mullins, Steve Mullins, brought in exhibit number three, which was a zoomed in close-up version of the map that we had just seen it was um the same air general area except for this time we had it was smaller in width it was only about four feet wide but it was eight feet high so it showed they wanted to show more you know in the vertical position Dina requested that kelsey come down and show the directions and things regarding the bridge specifically. So Kelsey said the bridge is here. We would walk across the Monon High Bridge and she showed the direction and across the driveway. So this is now on at this point Kelsey was discussing the road that she went to that they went down and confirmed that there was a different elevation to go down to the to the to the driveway and she went all the way to the gate there was a gate there and 
Diener asked her if she was aware that that was actually a private property driveway, and she did not. I observed Alan at this point. He had a blue pen in his hand, and he was moving over his whole body to study the map. And Diener asked if, if um, Libby and other kids would go there. There was lots of people at school that went there. Diener asked her if she remembered that it was starting to get dark or if she leave, she left the path and at this point wondered if Kelsey thought that something bad had happened, uh, her and her Uncle Cody. And Kelsey said, no, we just thought that they were out in the woods. And at this point, it was 2.11 p.m. Diener asked Kelsey if she had an opportunity to review the video that uh, she had sent her, I guess. And and Diener asked, is the bridge shorter because of improvements? And she agreed that it was. So if a person watches the video that they have made of the bridge, uh, they won't see the state that the bridge was in in 2017 because of the improvements that have been done. Kelsey testified that the bridge uh, was more rotten the entire length than it is now due to the improvements that they've made. At this point, the state enters exhibit number four. Uh, Mullins and Diener get this video set up, and it is a, a footage of the Mears entrance, and they and they play that, and Diener wants to ask questions, and so she asks Kelsey, as you come up to this, uh, where there's the T in the path, where does it go? She says, left is to the high bridge, and right is to the Freedom Bridge. There's no audio on this drone video. Now, they do indicate that it was not paved in 2017, such as it is for this drone video for state exhibit number four. So that's the one big difference um, because, and they, we did hear testimony about the date that they did do this evidence drone video at a later time. So this video showed a drone flight down the 501 trail and it was around three minutes in length but it felt like a really long time because there was no audio and it and it was actually great because it kind of represented how uh you know remote it is out there on that trail and you could really get a sense of that um, and we do again we do hear later information about this length of time on the video uh, with further testimony later. Diener said, is this area improved? And please talk about what you remember. Were there side rails on the bridge at that time? And Kelsey said no. Uh, the space between the Monon High Bridge and the ground, uh, you had to step over in 2017. At this point in the testimony, it was 2.17 p.m., and defense attorney Baldwin had a little sidebar conversation in private, uh, whispering with prosecutor Stacy Dieter. It was around 40 seconds, so they did have a little discussion there. Now, I should note that they had a white noise machine. I had never seen one or heard one used before. Now... Typically, when the attorneys would go to a sidebar with Judge Gall at the front of the courtroom, they would play this white noise machine, and it was, it was, um, it was good because you couldn't hear anything of what was said at that sidebar, and this was something new that we had not seen before in the other hearings prior prior to this trial. So they were definitely making sure that everything was being protected that shouldn't be on record or heard by the jury, more importantly. Uh, and I also noticed that Alan had been writing notes on his pad uh, with his pen during some of this uh, drone footage, uh, the drone flight down the 501. 
So, so now we have uh, the drone footage starting at the Monon High Bridge and going across the bridge. Deanir asked Kelsey if she could see the gravel driveway down to the left at the south end, or what they classify as the end of the Monon High Bridge. Next, we hear from Kelsey about the search groups on the 14th of February when the girls were found. They were divided up into groups. Kelsey said that her group went to the high bridge. She said she thought that they went down the other side, so the right side of the bridge is where they were looking. They were underneath the Monon High Bridge is where they were. And Diener asked her if she completed that search. And Kelsey said not long after they started searching, uh, they were they they were yelling to her. And they didn't, at that time, she did not know that her sister had passed. She was with um, two females that she knew. And I'm sorry, I had a little trouble hearing the names. I believe it was, it was pronounced Michael. Perhaps it was Michelle and Doreen. I thought she said Michael, but they were both females. Um, One of them worked at the school that she knew. And... Diener asked her if she knew if they were alive or dead, and she said no. And her grandfather, Brad German, is where she went after she learned that Libby, her sister, had passed. She went to him, his home. So, it was 2.34 p.m. on Friday, October 18th, day one of the trial, and Stacy Diener was done with her questioning of Kelsey, Libby's sister. So, a defense attorney, Andrew Baldwin, was the one to do the cross examination of Kelsey, and he started to refer to state exhibit number two, which was the large map. And at this point, A female that was in the gallery stood up and spoke out in court. So it was quite startling. Um, She had red hair, uh, long red hair. She'd been in the lineup outside in the morning. And she she stood up and she had her hand in the air. And Judge Gall seen her immediately, of course. She said firmly, you need to sit down, ma'am. And then she did not sit down. And then Judge Gull said again, you need to sit down, ma'am. Well, the woman did not sit down. And she spoke out and said, the microphone is not pointed towards the witness. And it's difficult to hear. And then she sat down. (laughs) So it was very awkward, of course. Everybody was kind of looking around going, oh my God. Um, But uh, she was not removed from the courtroom and that was the end of it. Uh, And nothing further was ever said. So it was obviously quite inappropriate, but it was it was actually very true <laughs> that you, you really could not hear uh, and i do think that the microphone d- was playing a factor in that but um uh anyway so baldwin continued on and he said where is the who's your harvester i thought you said that you hit the who's your harvester first and then the mirror's entrance and kelsey said no it's the other way around and baldwin said do you know that there's a camera on the Who's Your Harvester building? And she said, I heard about it, yeah. Baldwin said, it's, it's been a long time, but do you know if you backed out? And Kelsey said, no, I just pulled in. Libby was in the front of the car and Abby was in the back. Baldwin asked her, were you in the courtroom when your grandmother testified? And Kelsey said, no. He asked if Libby was an outspoken person. And then I think he said, bigly or regular outspoken? <laughs> I think he said bigly, but I, that's what I heard anyway. It was, it was a little odd. <laughs> but that's what he asked her. Was she, was she bigly or regular outspoken? 
And Kelsey said, I'd say regular. Baldwin asked, was she afraid to raise her voice? And Kelsey said, no. And Baldwin said, did she have a good, strong voice? And Kelsey said, yes. And Baldwin said, somehow you connected with Cody, your cousin. And then Kelsey corrected him and said, he's my uncle. And then he said, uncle, sorry. Baldwin said, now that bridge, you would call it dangerous. In fact, I think he said, you got on your hands and knees and crawled across it. Kelsey said the first time, yes. I wasn't stepping over the big asshole. He said, it would be a dangerous thing to do. Kelsey said, yes. Baldwin said, I want to clean up this Snapchat business with the 30-second disappearing messages. Kelsey said, Snap can have disappearing messages in 10 seconds, and 24 hours is, is on a story. He said, whenever Libby sent you something, it would be there for 24 hours, and she said yes. So he said, the, the image of Abby on the high bridge, on Libby's story, would have been. And she said yes. So Baldwin has Defense Exhibit A entered. He asked if it would be helpful to remind her um, of Libby's story. And he says, how far is Abby? How close is Abby? And she says, not very far. And he says, one half, one quarter, 25%. Diener objects. Then he says, the image that you saw on Libby's, what's it called again? And Kelsey says, story? <laughs> and, she, and I, of course, I looked up and she was quite incredulous that he didn't know what he's, you know, talking about. But anyway, um, <laughs> so then then um, Baldwin enters uh, 12 copies of of the exhibit and, and actually it should have been 16 of course because they have the four alternate jurors which I don't know um, if if you guys know but the four alternate jurors are seated in chairs in front of the 12 jury members in the jury box so they're immediately in front of them on the ground. Baldwin says you don't see anyone behind Abby in that picture and Kelsey says no and then they and then she's asked about Maya Abbott and Evan Fritz. They were people in and around the bridge. They would not be unknown to them. He says you talked about clothing. Libby put on a swim sweatshirt at noon. He asks her about the hair. Baldwin says you wouldn't expect your hair to be on it since you've never worn it. And she, Kelsey responded, well, when I washed it. At this point, Judge Gall asked the jury if anyone had any questions. And they did not. So Kelsey was excused from the witness stand. It was 2.50 p.m., Diener called Derek German, Libby's dad. He um, was really quite comfortable on the witness stand, and he was looking around. And this was actually really the first time that I have ever seen or heard from Derek. And uh, so that was just great. And he was actually quite funny, um, which you'll, you'll, I think you'll... Um, hopefully get some sense of uh, there were some moments with him on the stand um, <clears throat> Diener asked do you live in around Delphi he said yes did you graduate in Delphi yes my mom and stepdad and my two daughters is is, is where I lived she said do you have a job and he said not full-time I do small jobs do you help your mother Yes. Well, what kind of work? And it, she, he helped her uh, by 
uh, taking photos for her business. She asked if you would be running Libby to and from places. And he said, yes, school, things like that. She did a lot of activities. <clears throat> Excuse me. She did swimming, soccer, band, volleyball, softball. She was very, very active. At this point, it was 3 p.m. Dina asked, how, how did you and Libby communicate? And Derek responded by phone. He said he didn't have Snapchat. He said, I would try and call her, but she would just text me back. <laughs> it was really funny, actually, because that if you have a teenager or no one, you know that this is the case. They don't like to speak on the phone. But yeah, they texted and, and he would usually try to call. He said, are you familiar with Abby? And of course he was. Uh, she had stayed the night before. He had arranged to pick up Libby uh, from the bridge. And Diener asked him what he remembered. So Derek said he'd been making breakfast. He'd, uh, <clears throat> they'd made pancakes. There was a big mess to clean up. <laughs> um, there was a, a painting on, uh, he was painting a desk in the garage. And it was the same garage where his mom had her office. And at some point, he left, and it was around 1.20 p.m. that day on February 13th. So he would go and take original photos of houses for appraisals, and he went to Frankfurt, Indiana that day. He had a list of addresses and a map of addresses. And Libby had called and asked if he would pick them up after he was in Frankfurt. He had dropped Libby and Kelsey once before at the bridge. It was around the summertime. He couldn't quite remember when. He had 18 pictures of 18 houses to take that day. So he had said that it would take him a couple of hours. And Diener asked if he took all 18 photos of the uh, pictures of the houses. And he said yes. It was 3, 3 p.m. in the courthouse. Diener said, did you pass the Who's Your Harvester? And Derek said yes. He said he came from the opposite direction. He said you dropped them before but you had never been out there yourself. And he said, no. I, when I was a couple of minutes away, I called. You called, you didn't text. And he said, right, yeah, there's no answer. Diener asked him if there were other cars parked at the entrance and he said, yes. So then she said, Have, you went left towards the Mona High Bridge and he said, I went forward. I ran into someone and asked if they had seen two teenage girls. Derek testified that he didn't know the man, uh, but his name is Dave McCain. Uh, someone had told him that. So Diener said he was coming away from the Moen High Bridge then. And he said, yes, that was at about 11, uh, sorry, 3.11 p.m. Two minutes later, he got to the entrance, the actual entrance, and he knows that because he looked at his phone data. So the first thing that Derek did was he walked down towards the water at Deer Creek, which is what he meant by going forward. There's nobody there. Then he went up the hill and he turned towards Freedom Bridge. And are you still calling Libby? He was asked. He said yes. There was a Subaru white station wagon. He went back to the car and he called and he says, I called mom. She hadn't heard from them. And Diener said, and Becky Patty is mom? And he said yes. 
were you calling out for the girls? He said, yes. In all the directions, I was yelling. But you didn't get any response, correct? He said, no. Sat there for about 15 minutes. Then I got back out of the car. Two kids pulled up. And, he, and she was asked, did you cross the bridge when you got to it? And he said, as soon as I got to the high bridge, two kids were sitting on the platform of the deck. And I asked them, and it was a boy and a girl. And Diener asked him to explain about the, the decks, the platforms. Um, and he said that they were a four foot by six foot uh, place where you could stand out on the bridge. Diener asked then who arrived and he said Kelsey and Cody said she said do you recall if there was a barricade could a person walk around it and he said yes or under it it was only about this high and on the witness stand Derek held up his hands uh just just above his belly button type of thing um so they could have uh, got under it he said my sister was parked there and I got in her vehicle and I tried to figure out what to do next. And then he said, Mom pulled up. And Mike pulled up across the road. On the other side. <clears throat> there were two kids. A boy and a girl. The one was on a moped and one was on a razor. And scooters. He said, I don't even think I made it to the end. The cops started showing up. They wanted us to go to the police station. Everyone had been driving around looking around town uh, after the police station. Derek testified that there were other parts of the trail system in Delphi that he would take Libby to and drop her off at. There's a bridge behind the Pizza Hut at Bicycle Bridge Road and over near an area over near the canal where Libby would go. Derek stated that he used a flashlight to search in the dark, that he was searching by himself. He was asked if he knew if Cody was searching as well, and I unfortunately could not hear that answer. Um, so Diener said, I would like to show you a map, and she entered exhibit number three. This area shows the high bridge, so at this point, uh, Dina requests that Derek step off the stand and come down to the large map. We're looking at once again of the area zoomed in. This is exhibit number three. It's of the cemetery and the ravine. It's the elongated uh, map that they had on the stand, on the, sorry, on the easel. And he, he said it was too steep to go down but he looked with his flashlight, and that's the area that he was looking for the girls. This was the night they disappeared on February 13th between 10 p.m. and 12 a.m. is when Derek was out there at this time. He stated that he could see flashlights east of the ravine. Did you see flashlights? And he said no. So next, Derek testified about the city building, which is where they were organizing uh, the search for the girls from. They gave everyone uh, search areas. They actually gave Derek the same search area, uh, but a bit bigger of, of a location that he had been. They gave him a map of where to go, and he parked by the CPS building when he went to search at that time. He said that they walked from the CPS entrance along 300 uh, Highway on the road. He was with his daughter, uh, and I couldn't quite hear her name, um, so I won't. I, I thought it was Glenna, maybe. Um, but he was with his daughter, and he was continuing on with the search, and this was on the 14th now. They stayed along the field and they made it all the way to the ravine. And then he saw his aunt, which is Becky's sister. Her name is Melissa Lowry. 
And Derek stated that he thinks that she was just out there searching. Like, she hadn't been a part of any organized searches. She she was just out there. Um, so, he showed on the map, basically, it's it's all the fields is, is where they had walked. Like, all along the edge is the way it was described. Next, Diener said, after you separated from your aunt, Melissa, when did you find out about Libby? And he said, quote, I could tell something was up. I heard mom screaming. She had learned something. And then Derek indicated that he seen the coroner's van and there were about 12 cop cars there. And I do have to say that when he s described hearing Becky screaming, it was very uh, heart-wrenching to hear that from him. Um, so when he found out, um, his dad took Kelsey back to his house. So that would have been Brad German and his wife um now Diener says I don't want to embarrass you you're a big man it seems like that area would have been very difficult area for you to traverse and he agreed so Derek confirmed once again that there were no lights seen the night of February 13th there were no flashlights searching east of the ravine that night. There was an awful lot of discussion about flashlights uh, on day one in the afternoon, and this is obviously critical information um, for the events and the timeline of how things went. What does the Freedom Bridge look like? It's a big blue bridge. <laughs> I I don't know why, but when he said that, it just struck me really funny. It was it was it was perfect actually. Because I have to say, and I'm just gonna step off the transcript here for a minute. When I went to Delphi for the first time for the three day hearings, um, back in July, I I really was very surprised at the number of bridges that are around there. So I'm you know, I'm imagining the jury who is from Allen County, you know, they're not from Carroll County. And it's, I don't know, it's approximately two hours away, Fort Wayne area, where they're pulled from. And I don't, and you know, all these bridges that they're speaking of, I can imagine when they're first exposed to all of this, and it's, you know, it, it's quite, it's quite a lot to get a hold of. So when he said the big blue bridge, I thought that's perfect because that's what it is, right? So when they're going to get into this, it's, it's, and there is a lot of talk about these bridges, all these bridges. In fact, the defense brings up a, yet another bridge. But anyway, um, I just had to, had to tell you guys that because it was, it was kind of funny because it was, you know, it was perfect. <laughs> um, so here we go. Baldwin says, the railroad bridge. There's another one behind the Freedom Bridge. And he said no. <laughs> and he looked really confused. Now, I don't know what... I've never heard of the railroad bridge either. But apparently the defense has something about that. They wanted to know about that bridge. Um, but Derek didn't know about it. So once again, we're back to on the cross-examination by Baldwin. Um, he wants to talk about when when Derek saw Dave McCain. So this was, again, when Derek had said he had gone straight when he got uh, to, the, to the entrance at the mirrors. Um, so he said that he was coming from the high bridge he said to you that he hadn't seen anyone. And Derek said that McCain said that he saw a couple. Next, Baldwin gets into 
10 p.m. to midnight on February 13th, when Derek was searching, he testified that he's seen a lot of lights. And on the service road on the south side of the bridge is where there was a fire truck. And he's, and Baldwin said, was it bright that it would have illuminated the river, uh, the lights that were seen? And unfortunately, his response was, Derek's response was inaudible. But he said there were, quote, tons of people. At this point, I observed Alan writing again. It was 3.30 p.m. in the court. Baldwin says, you don't know where every flashlight was, but you saw lots of them. And then he asked him something. Uh, Baldwin asked him a question, which I could not hear. But Derek responded that there were some flat areas. Yes. And then Baldwin says, 9199. Were these the last four numbers of your phone number at that time? And he said, yes. And Baldwin said, were you, were you with a group when you went out in these woods at that time? And Derek said, no. At this time, Gall asked the jury if they had any questions for Derek. And they said, or sorry, they didn't say no. There weren't any. Uh, now, the jury's passing questions to the court reporter. And then they get passed through to Judge Gall. And it's uh, one thing that's new that we haven't seen yet are uh, when these questions get passed to Judge Gall, um, they put the white noise machine on. And then <clears throat> Gull and, and, and the attorney from each side go to the far left of the courtroom in the corner. It's kind of tucked, it's all tucked away, kind of in behind where they have the big TV screen set up. So they have a bit of privacy and they have a little discussion on the questions, you know. And then, um, and I don't know exactly how that all works, but, and then Judge Gull comes back. They turn off the white noise machine and then she reads aloud the questions and the witness answers. And so, and I'm sure that we're going to hear a lot of questions um, from this jury. And they don't say which juror is asking the questions, but I can just tell by the number of questions that we, we do end up hearing um, in the first couple of days of a trial that we are going to get the questions and it's great <laughs> it's great to hear them because then you you know you know that they're paying attention they, they, they you know that where there might be some things that the jury isn't understanding or maybe you need to address and, and make more clear and in fact we end up seeing that on day two but I'll leave that <laughs> for another for another video update. So Judge Gall addresses the jury. <clears throat> Excuse me. She says, please do not discuss the case with other members of the jury. She said, all 16 members must be present if you're going to discuss. So I do think they're allowed at lunch to discuss when they are all together. But they are not even allowed to discuss the case with each other when they're one-on-one -on -one or anything like that. They have to have all 16 of them there, four alternates and the 12 jury. So we went for an afternoon break for 15 minutes from 3.30 to 3.45. I saw Matt Hoffman, the house investigator, um, speaking with the blonde uh, friend of uh, Kathy Allen's. One thing I do want to um, touch base on here is... It's very different the way we're seeing Alan with his street clothes on, but not just him, the law enforcement that are escorting him in and out. They, they do not have police uniforms on. They are very fit, <laughs> large, tall men uh, that definitely look like they know what they're doing. Um, they're very coordinated in their movements and expressionless. They box Alan in, so to speak. When So they're seated three in a row directly behind him in the well of the court when he's seated at the table. Now, the positioning that we've seen 
at trial is very different than the other hearings that we've seen. We have the state on the far left of the courtroom on a bit of an angle. And then we have the defense dead center in the middle in front of Judge Gull. And one thing that's interesting here, we've always seen Allen on the far right side of the table when we've been facing forward in the courtroom, um, either right to the right or, you know, second from the right. Well, now we have him furthest away from the jury, so to speak. He's on the far left, um, and then he uh, has Rosie seated next to him, and then attorney uh, Jennifer OJ, and then defense attorney Andrew Baldwin. Um, and then perpendicular to that, on the far right side of the courtroom, if you're facing forward, we've got the jury. They're elevated so they can see in the jury box. And then we have the four alternates, as I mentioned, on chairs in front. And they all have notepads, folders um, that they can keep the exhibits in, that they can mark up, they can uh, uh, write their questions, take their notes, which many of them were. So when they're, sorry, so when they're boxing in Allen for the security, they form a C around him, like the letter C. So they have one in front of him, one to his left side, and then one on the, on the rear. And it's, when, one thing when he was being transported with the guards and he was in his shackles and everything else, it was very obvious when they took him in and out of the courtroom. It's, I've noticed, like, I haven't even seen him come in or out. It's much more discreet. So he's blend, he's, you know, he's blended in. He's in his street clothes. He's wearing a belt. He's got, you know, the glasses on top of his head. So, you know, he's, um, that's the presentation. And, and, and so that's, that's been a bit interesting to observe. And there are other plainclothes officers around the court as well. So at 3.56, they brought Alan back in. There was a little bit of gallery noise. It wasn't too bad. Um, but at one point, uh, the bailiff yelled out, quiet in the courtroom. And then... Judge Gull asked something like not too long after he said that, maybe a minute or so later. She said something to the attorneys or, yeah, it had to be the attorney. And then she said, hello, people, I'm speaking to you. <laughs> so it was kind of, it was a bit funny because it was, <laughs> you know, we were silenced. And then I, I don't know, the, the attorneys were silenced too, I think. So it was 358 Anna Williams was called to the stand from Stacy Diener. So she asked her, in February of 2017, were, were you and Abby living in Delphi? And she said yes. She was. They were living with her mom, stepdad, and I believe she said her grandparents. It was a bit hard to hear. She said that we grew up in Michigan. Uh, Anna testified that her father was an automotive teacher in high in a high school, and he got transferred to Lafayette, which is about 25 minutes away from Delphi. The majority of the time, Abby took a bus to school both ways, 95% of the time. Um, so next, she was asked where she worked. She worked, Anna worked at St. Elizabeth Healthcare in the kitchen. She served lunch uh, and dinner. She also worked at a place called The Dock. She was a waitress and bartender. Every other weekend, she worked that job part-time. And then we had uh, emo some emotional testimony. It was... Um, it was, um, sad. Um, Diener asked, <clears throat> how would you describe her? And she said, 
she was a very kind little girl. And she broke, Anna broke up a bit here. Um, and, uh, you know, her face, I looked up, of course, because I could hear it. And I looked up and her face was all wrinkled up, going kind of red and blotchy. She, um, she pulled it together. And, um, she said Abigail was kind, funny. She was smart. She was shy. And then <laughs> Dina asked her, how did she do in school? <laughs> and Anna said, fair <laughs> to some extent. And then she laughed. So that was, you know, it was a very real moment there that we had when she was on the stand um, hearing about Abby. So she said, Diener said, did she have a large circle of friends? And Abby said, it was pretty small. She played volleyball. She was in the band and she would have done softball. Um, she, uh, uh, Anna testified that she worked a lot of weekends, that um, Abby did go to church. And Diener asked did Abigail have a phone? And Anna testified that she did not. Uh, she was going to have one at high school, but she would not have needed to have one. Diener asked her, was it working out pretty well with her not having a phone? She didn't have one. And Abby said it was, or sorry, Anna said it was fine. And Diener said, what about Abby's willingness to take risks? And Anna said, well, she loved roller coasters. She said heights didn't bother her as much as they bothered me. And she said, do you have a cell phone? Anna responded, yes. Uh, next, Anna was asked about uh, her relationship with Libby and Becky and um, in that whole relationship. And she said she'd been over there before, that um, they'd gone to Florida. She was like an older sister. She asked, Dina asked Anna if she and Abby were close. Anna said, I would say so. Next, Anna was asked about the night prior with Abby's grandfather, and I think that she called it the Braden White Hotel in Monticello, the Saturday night for sure, that Abby had uh, stayed with her grandfather, and I think it's I think it was Braden White is what she called it. Um, but they had done that. Um, she discussed Walmart. And she had met Libby at the park. Um, it was difficult to hear some of this testimony. So there's a, a few little gaps here. I apologize. Uh, and then Anna said, I brought them back to my house. And then Sunday it was asked if she could stay over. Um, she did talk about working um, at Miller's Health Care. In Prospect, Indiana. Um, so she was working the dinner shift until, and then until 8 p.m. at the bar. At what point did you learn they were missing? Uh, 5.30 p.m. on the 13th, Anna responded. I was supposed to work until 8 p.m. that night. I kept missing calls from Becky. There were three calls. But I didn't know it was Becky Patty. There was one incident at the school at a swim meet where they weren't answering their phones, Abby and Libby. Anna testified that she had been frantic and that that had taken a place uh, one year prior. Other than that, were there any concerns about Abby? Uh, Anna responded no. 4.17 p.m. in the court and Andrew Baldwin comes on for the cross-examination. 
He started it this way. Hi, Anna. How would you describe Abby's voice? Well, she had her family and friends voice, and then she had her other voice where she was shy and soft. She was high-pitched when she got excited. And that concluded Anna Williams' testimony. It was 4.18 p.m. The attorneys went forward with Judge Gall. The white noise come on. There was a sidebar. And then we had uh, State Exhibit 5 entered when they brought a new deputy onto the stand. Finally, we had Mitchell uh, Catrone. He's a deputy with the Carroll County uh, Sheriff's Department. He had a brown uniform on, on the witness stand. Uh, Judge Go had indicated that it, there could, it could be very lengthy testimony. So they were going to split it into two, for um, possibly, because we were nearing the end of the day. Um, I think uh, they're going to end up recalling him as we didn't get into that. Uh, you'll you'll hear in a minute. So he's been with the uh, Carroll County Sheriff's Department for 12 years. He studied at the Law Enforcement Academy. Um, field training programs. He's a reserve deputy uh, in around Carroll County at the time of the murders. There were some te technical issues um, with the red pointer that they wanted him to use. Uh, Nick wanted him to use um, because the jury... Um, could they thought they could see better by using the pointer but what ended up happening is it wasn't working properly even after um, Nick McClelland went to zoom it in so he said let's do this the old-fashioned way and he had a point um, he wanted Catron to identify the who's your heartland highway the location of the CPS building the Mears entrance Nick was very loud and confident and commanding we had been having audio issues all day. It was the end of the day, and it was good because um, he was a lot uh, easier to hear than certainly than Stacy Diener had been. She's, I didn't really remember her being that soft spoken at the three day hearings. So I definitely think there's an issue um, a little bit with the audio. It's it was you know it wasn't it wasn't. Um, as loud as it could have been. I, I'm not sure why. Uh, but they'll get it straightened out, I'm sure. Um, so Nick, at the end of the day, it, it brought it brought everybody kind of, you know, it'd been a, a really long day. And um, so it was good timing. I don't know if he had planned to do his testimony or not but um he did come in and it was and it was good it was a good way to finish out the day um so deputy Catron would work a 6 a.m to 6 p.m shift at 5 15 there was a call from dispatch a gentleman wanted assistance he didn't know who it was at the time and later come to find out his name was mike patty there were two kids missing. Um, so Catrone went to 625 West. Uh, that's all I had for the address, but it's it's the Weber's home at the south side of the Monon High Bridge. There's a private drive there. Brad Weber lives there. Um, <clears throat> so then Catrone reviewed the private drive with Nick. He did not turn on his flashing lights. Uh, he was there for around five to seven minutes, and he did not yell for them. He, d he did not yell for the girls, is what I heard. Um, he did not know that Brad Weber lived there, but he knocked and he asked, and Weber was normal. Uh, he was. Nick asked him, was he covered in sweat? No. Was he covered in blood? No. Was he disheveled in any way? No. He obtained permission to search the out or to to search the property and he had a look around the outbuildings on the Weber property. There's a very large building, outbuilding at the back, which was and 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 a barn. Um they were looking for the girls. 
he sorry he was looking for the girls Catron was looking for the girls he didn't see anything it was at the end of his shift he stayed overtime uh, at least 30 minutes he said it was dark he didn't see anything or talk to Brad Weber again Nick says on 625 did you see the girls at the time you left work after 6 p.m were you getting updates on a possible location of the girls? And he said no. There was no other info. Doc, uh, Jennifer OJ took the cross-examination for Catron. And she started off by asking him if he went through school and, and was taught how to investigate. He agreed that he had. How far west of the Hoosier Harvester is the Sheriff's Department? Half a mile, he responded. Um, so, five to seven minutes. That would make it around 5.22 to 5.25 p.m. How long did it take to get to the 6.25 address? He said about three minutes. There was a bit of back and forth here. I didn't quite catch it all, uh, but there'd been a previous call to the Weber's property um, regarding a chicken coop. Um, that I didn't, I couldn't really understand. And they actually ended up going to the what I thought it was called the CAD report. Um, OJ ended up. OJ ended up taking him uh the cad report and he was grateful to get that um i think i wrote it down a little later um so you got to the who's your who's your uh sorry the high bridge at 5 47 p.m and you didn't go down uh down the hill and he, on the private drive and he said no said he went on down the access road and uh when you're driving down the access road Will you, will you see the water? And he said, you cannot see the water. The access road is higher, and because of the terrain, he said, where did you park in his driveway? I didn't catch the response on that. He said he did not, uh, oh, she says, you didn't hear anything. And he says, I'm always listening. Catron stated that um, he was with... Brad Weber at his door for a few seconds, a minute tops. He did walk to the large outbuilding and also another outbuilding on the property. OG said, would it refresh your recollection to look at the CAD reports? And he said, absolutely. So she entered Defense Exhibit C, uh, which contained the times for the CAD report. She asked him, how long did you spend searching at the Webers and he said uh five to ten minutes was the range were your windows down and I didn't catch the response to that unfortunately I happened to observe Alan looking back at his family at this point it was uh 4 43 p.m in the day Catron said I was not made aware of the magnitude of the search OJ says, did you see any flashlights? So you followed up on tips from the tip line. He said he, he did not man the phone calls for the tip line. He followed up on them. OJ wanted to know how long was that a part of your job? It wasn't a year. It was a couple of months, I think. Um, did you ever hear or investigate any tips on Richard Allen? And he said no. At this point, OJ said that she had some questions outside of the scope. And Judge Gall, OJ, and McClelland went forward um, for a sidebar with the ambient noise, or uh, the white noise, rather. And... Um, they were up there about three minutes. So I do think that there's going to be more um, 
with Catron, it sounds like uh, quite a bit more, <laughs> probably. But they, and also because of what Judge Gall stated about him being lengthy as a witness. Um, but at this point, he wasn't on the stand much longer. They come back and Nick said, at any time, did you get out and search the creek? Catron said no. He says, you stayed in the car and looked out? Yes. Just because you didn't see them doesn't mean that they weren't there. And then OJ said, ask and answer. So the jury ended up having a couple of questions. I only caught the answer to the first one. But jury question number one, is it common for people walking to the bridge to turn around if you know? And Catrone responded, I don't know. The second question for the jury was, does the trail continue on the north side of the ravine? I didn't catch that answer. It was 4.47 p.m. Uh, the jury was uh, excused. There was two offers of proof at the bench put forward. Um, There's a, a, a deposition and a motion to eliminate for the third party. They were both by the defense. The defense entered Exhibit D, which was a deposition of Anna Williams from August 30th of this year. Now, <clears throat> Judge Gall said preliminary, um, uh, sorry, um, yeah, she said, before I, I begin to read this this evening, um, is this brand new evidence that you're you're offering because we had the three day hearings July thirty first August first, and could it not have been dealt with then? And he said no, it was August thirtieth after, and so therefore it would not be um, recalled. So there's new evidence that the defense wants to submit. I guess. She hasn't done the rulings on those yet that I know of. Um, <laughs> but I haven't been all over the documents since I've been at trial here. State exhibit number five was a housekeeping issue um, that Nick uh, entered, which is basically the, the photographs that were on the TV. Um, you know, they're large exhibits that I discussed. He submitted a USB stick so that they could be, um, I believe he said, printed and handed out to the jury for their folders. Um, they deferred the offer of proof for the officer, Catrone, that had just testified. Uh, J Judge Gall indicated that the media has demanded the um, evaluation of the exhibits <clears throat> at the end of the day. So they would be called forward for 15 minutes. Um, and Rosie had a housekeeping matter as well, but I didn't, I didn't capture that. I'll have to pay more attention to where they're bringing Alan in and out from, because I don't know if it's, I, I, it just, it seems to me like it's just a lot less obvious when they're transporting him in, uh, in and out of the courtroom. Um, it, it, it just, in the other hearings, it was very obvious and, uh, it, and it hasn't been, <laughs> but then again, maybe I was just too tired to notice that. I, I don't look up too much, but I have caught him be coming in and out, you know, at every hearing. So, <laughs> so one, one thing I do want to add is that the commissioner of in Delphi ruled that he they were go, uh, sorry I don't know if it's male or female they were going to allow camping at the courthouse so there there is overnight camping allowed but not on the grass in other words if people are going to line up um, they're going to allow it now we did not see that happen thankfully on Friday night. Um, most people that attended the first day of, tri of trial did not sleep. Many had gone over the night before at 8 p.m. The line had started, which was ridiculous and, quite frankly, unnecessary. But thankfully, that didn't happen Friday night. And it was what I would call a much more uh, normal 
<laughs> start of the line, although some people had gone over very early, but not very many. Less than less than five, I think. So it was it was what I would consider a normal line on Friday night. I was able to attend on uh, day two. It, we, there's always going to be, from my understanding currently, is uh, Saturdays are only from 9 a.m. to 12 p.m. And they open the doors at 8.30. So hopefully you guys um, were able to listen to my terrible voice, which I've lost again. <laughs> and um, Sarah and I are running on... Um, very little sleep um, and um, have to apologize. It's been a bit chaotic, but we'll get in the flow of things and uh, get everyone uh, the information as accurately and as quickly as we can. Thank you for listening.